evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is truly an honor to be standing in front of you here today. It is our first time. We are the American University of Beirut, and we are proudly representing Lebanon. It's worth noting that it's always better to build something a hundred people would love than to build something a thousand people sort of like. Similarly, Wealthfront was successfully uh, putting all its effort in focusing on the techies, whereby it was able to eat the big guy's lunch. Temporarily, not for long. The big guys are back on track, competitive as ever, and it's now a call for action. Today, the AUV Consulting Club, Hirak, Maya, Jad, and I, Dania, are going to present to you a strategy in order to make Wealthfront as competitive, in order for it to penetrate the market, increase its growth, and eventually reach its full potential and prove itself as a startup. So the main issue for today is how can Wealthfront break through the competition, prove itself again in the wealth management field to sustain eventually its growth. Now, to understand more the situation, it's very important to look at the external environment as well as the internal environment. So we have the global environment that's influencing the small environment, which is the industry. So we have the political factors, the ecological factors, the economical factors, and the legal factors. Now, in the wealth management industry, there's a new industry, which is the fintech industry, which is where we are in. We have also our strategic group, which you can see covers part of the fintech and also part of the wealth management industry, because as we, can, as we see in the case, uh, we have many giants from the wealth management industry growing, uh, going slowly into the fintech industry and very successfully. Also, the industry effect, it's worth, it's worth to note that it's 55%, it takes 55% of its effect on what happens to a company compared to 25% of the firm effects, all the decisions internally. Now the external environment, uh, we're defining it uh, we're by, by the fintech industry, so we have many opportunities, basically the growth of internet penetration worldwide, and also the increased consumption and use of consumer electronics. We also have a growing demand for financial services, both investment advisory and asset management, which reached uh, 120 trillion dollars in 2007, uh, 2016. We also have many threats that are very um, um, threatening to uh, our company, for example, which is a stock market downturn, which would increase the withdrawals and decrease the EVMs. Also, we have increase in uh, competition, competition intensity, so we have a growing uh, uh, numbers of competitors and very successful competitors, and also a potential industry disruption by a potential startup. Now, uh, to, to analyze further the competitive rivalry in our industry, which is the fintech industry, so we have two main uh, sources of powers that influence uh, our company. So we have the power of buyers, which is quite high because they're very price sensitive, they have low loyalty, and they have low switching costs. So when they are dissatisfied with our products, they'll just go to another competitor. Also, we have a threat of new entry, especially from the industry giants, which have a huge client base and they have the ability to create synergies through this client base. For example, Charles Schwab and Vanguard, who have uh, 2.6 trillion in AUMs, and Vanguard 3.2 trillions in AUM, which is far higher than what we have. So both, is, uh, both uh, threat and power of buyers is very high, which makes the competitive rivalry high itself because of the increased uh, number of players and because of the attractiveness of the industry as a whole. Now to analyze further our competition, our main competitor is Betterman. So um, we have a better team than them. We have eight, you have eight PhDs compared to two PhDs. Uh, we have very high automation, whereas they have low automation uh, because they introduced the human uh, advisory uh, system and also they have a low, lower client acquisition cost so they are less than 1k per client whereas we are uh, around 1k per client we also have uh, higher prices so uh, for the 10k uh, and below it's eight per zero percent but for the 10k and above it's 0 0.5 compared to uh, 0 0.5 uh, for Betterment and 0 0.15 with the, all the, 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 the clients who are above 100k, which we are targeting as uh, techies. And also we have lower AUMs, so they have uh, almost double our AUMs uh, with uh, 7.5 million dollars. 
Now, it's uh, very worth to note the internal environment in what in what front. We have many strengths which differentiate us from our competitors, which is uh, most importantly our human uh, your human capital capital. So we have really strong credentials with create which creates trust and uh, inspires experience of the team and it would uh, grow your client base tremendously. Also, uh, you have a strong brand image and technical expertise which allows you to go into uh, a further technological advancement which would respond to your customer needs. And also, we have deep understanding of our target customers. We strongly, uh, uh, you deeply um, watch them and see what their preferences are and their needs and adapt to them. We have, uh, you have many, uh, some weaknesses, so we have high employee turnover by the departure of high ranked executive, which might be a kind of, um, th um, it might, um, your customers might fear that because it might be a bad indicator, but you also, uh, you also have a high client acquisition cost. So as you can see, for, for example, compared to Betterment, your costs are higher, but you provide higher value and you have higher prices. So that creates a parity in the value that you provide to your customers compared to Betterment. Now having cleared out our analysis, this is how we decided on the three main alternatives that we are going to evaluate. The first one is acquisition. So we can be acquired by a VC or by a traditional investment bank that can eventually uh, help us find the funding and have the proprietary algorithms and event eventually uh, expand our network since actually you are um, an attractive startup. Now the second alternative is market expansion and by that we mean targeting new industries and thus increasing your customer base, increasing your brand exposure. So why only restrict yourself to the techies? Now the third alternative is market penetration whereby you can do that through partnerships and through focusing your sales efforts in the tech industry so whereby we have uh, space for growth. So in order to evaluate each, we put the pros and cons of each of the three alternatives. Starting with the acquisition, the pro is that you have the dedicated funding, you, have, you can have more investments, and thus you can have an access to the large network. The con is that you might have the loss of an autonomy, and we quote the founder, who is now um, uh, actually very, you know, he's, he's being very thoughtful about the company and that he's not only an investor but a, a founder, so he wants to have decision-making power. And there's also the risk of cultural clashes, which is uh, quite difficult to mitigate. Now, the second, uh, for the second alternative, which is market expansion, the pro is that you can have a diversified client base, uh, and you can also increase your brand exposure. In addition to that, it's a new revenue stream. The con is that it is not aligned with your mission and vision, whereby you started up by choosing to focus on the techies. In addition to that, you might have the lack of, exper of expertise to get into new industries. Now for the third alternative, which is market penetration, this would definitely increase your market share. It would also help you regain your position as a market leader. And in addition to that, it would we know that there is increased growth in the tech industry since it's a booming industry. The con is that you might not have an un undiversified the client base, which is not so bad. So as we can see, the market penetration, the pros of uh, evaluation of pros and cons are more than that of the market expansion and more than that of acquisition. Eventually, we decided to go for market penetration. Now, how is that going to happen? We built our, uh, the implementation of our strategy upon three dimensions. First, the business model. Second, HR, human resources. Third, customer acquisition. Now, starting out with the three alternatives. The first one, which is the business model. We suggest that you adjust your pricing model, and this is due to the, due to the data and our analysis. So your current business mo pricing model is that it's, fr it's free for investments of between zero and $10,000, and it's 0.25% for $10,000 for above $10,000. So our suggestion, the data, the data indicates that you should keep the, between zero and $10,000 for free. You should make that between $10,000 and $100,000 for 0.2% and then add two new divisions which are between $100,000 and $500,000 for um, a percentage of 0.15 and for uh, the $500,000 plus for 0.1% uh, and that is due to the fact that we want you to increase your competitiveness and be able to keep up with the pace of your competitors. 
So this new pricing model would eventually help you do that. So we also suggest that you add a human touch, not change what you already have, but add, tweak it a bit. So this will only be applied to the clients of $100,000 plus. As you can see, we added two new segments. So this is going to be applied to those new segments. Why do we suggest that? First, because it improves customer relations. It also increases trust, which is a great factor. And uh, we also suggest that you have weekly blogs and open a page for Q&As in order to have smoother communication. Now, we want, to, uh, we want to note that this is an alert. This will not affect your mission and vision. You are going to focus on your way of doing things, of your robots, on your robots. So this is limited and restricted on the $100,000 clients and above. So it's a restricted tool. And in addition to that, the human element is only for the client interaction and for advising and not for trading. So this will not change how you are doing it. The next step we're going to talk about is what you should do to address your top management turnover. So first of all, one reason that top management might be turning over is due to lack of recognition for their work. So first of all, we suggest that you implement a recognition program that will happen once a year in order to recognize your top management and allow them to feel like they are worth something at your company. Second of all, we want you to stress on creativity and innovation due to your company's position as an innovative startup and as a creative startup that has disrupted its industry. We want you to continue promoting that to maintain your competitive edge. Second of all, we suggest that you offer stock options to your top management to help incentivize them to stay with your company. By doing this, you'll give them part, you'll give them the belonging of ownership to the company, and they'll feel as though they are part of the company, and they will try strive to help it succeed. Moreover, we believe you should try to focus on a common goal where the company as a whole believes in success, not just the top management, so that the individuals who are working under the top management will also believe that they are part of the company as well. To do this, we believe that top management needs to focus on communication with the, their employees and help them feel as though they are achieving the same goal. The next step is to focus on your algorithms. You have an individual uh, proprietary algorithm that has set you apart from your competitors. So by doing this, you need to maintain your edge and reestablish yourselves as the leader. We suggest hiring two uh, PhD holders to help improve the algorithms, as well as two masters in financial engineering. This will help refine the algorithm, as well as improve rates of return and increase its efficiency. So, the next step is to focus on the customer acquisition. Uh, the first suggestion we have is to have a partnership with tech conferencing and tech uh, competition companies such as TechCrunch. By doing this, you'll have uh, services to offer them for all of the companies involved in the conference. Uh, you'll be able to offer them the lowest cost of your, you and your competitors. And what the conferences have to offer you is access to all of these new tech startups that show extreme viability in the long term, as well as have need for services such as yours. Uh, we'll, what we'll also be suggest that you offer them is the ability to network with your other customers. How we suggest you do this is by implementing a new forum on your platform that allows for uh, customers to interact with each other on an optional basis. No one is required to do so, but if they choose to network, then they have the ability to do so. So this will be very user-friendly and allow for your customers to communicate between each other and collaborate. Finally, we suggest that you, that you focus on tech corporations. You've shown extreme success with tech corporations such as Facebook and Twitter, and we believe that you should focus your efforts there due to the large uh, users, their large customer base, and their large number of employees. So we suggest that you focus your efforts on new tech IPOs, as well as tech companies that are approaching the IPO stage. And by maintaining your lowest uh, management fees, you'll be able to ensure that these companies choose you. The final step, which we haven't done yet, is the, which you haven't done yet, is the management retirement fund. This is going to be in the long-term phase of the implementation in which you try to grow as a company and not just focus your efforts. So we suggest that you focus on uh, attracting wealthy traditional investors who have a diversified, which will give you a diversified customer base and allow you to have another sector to focus your efforts on. Now we suggest that this uh, uh, sector, due to the large amount of uh, management funds available and due to the lack of competitiveness in the market. So in the long term, we suggest diversifying after you've penetrated your current tech market. Now this is the timeline for the implementation of our strategy. It begins on an annual basis for the 
with first of all adjusting your current rates to improve uh, customer acquisition, then having a short increase in hiring sales representatives, then as you acquire more targets, more customers, and your current sales representatives aren't able to satisfy all of their needs, additional hiring will occur yearly. Second is implementing the recognition, recognition program, which will occur every year to ensure that top management stays uh, satisfied. Finally, the stock options will help ensure that. Moreover, the additional uh, algorithm uh, sales people, uh, algorithm uh, implementers will be acquired on a bi-yearly basis as needed by the company. Uh, we suggest an initial partnership run for the first year uh, where there's heavy investment in partnerships and trying to acquire as many partnerships as possible before your competitors follow a similar line of business. After you're done acquiring the partnerships is when we suggest beginning your implementation in the pension fund business. Now my colleague Kaur is going to talk to you about the industry as a whole and the financial relevance. Since we talked about the tech industry and how many new corporations we want to attract, we decided to do an analysis for you to see how many potential clients we can add. So the way we structured it is that we took the current base now, which is only Twitter and Facebook. And we're assuming that the AUM per client is 40,000. So the total added AUM is 120 million. And the contribution to your total AUM is 2.4%. So in 2018, the assumption is that we will add 10,000 new clients based on as in clients as in corporations since we live in a world where cloud enterprise is booming, software engineering is booming, so a lot of new tech companies are IPOing and we're assuming that after 100, the 180 day lock of expiration, those people will want to sell their holdings and divest, which is the service that we offer. So we believe that we, you, you, can attract, you can attract those customers. And the AUM per client will also increase because we, the larger the company is, the more wealthier the employees are. So based on that current trend, we, believe we can add 10,000 corporations per year by 2020, and the contribution to your total AUM will be approximately between 7 or 8%, which uh, data indicates that it's a, let's say, a large contribution to the AUM. Well, as an example, in 2017, we wanted to show you how your clients will be distributed. So currently you have around approximately 100,000 clients. Corporate clients will add 3,000. Clients with, who will invest less than $10,000 will add approximately 10,000 clients. And the clients who are going to invest between 100,000 and 500,000 are going to be approximately 7,000 because of our new cost structure that my colleague showed you. And of course, the, well, the more wealthy clients that will, put, will invest more than half a million dollars, they're going to, let's say, approximately 1,000 clients. And the clients that we, you will attract from Charles Schwab, Vanguard, Fidelity, because of the human touch that we introduced. And of course, this, uh, this trend continues by 2018, 19, and 20, when we add more tech companies and more pension funds. Of course, your main goal, we believe, should be to quadruple the AUMs by 2020. It is doable based on the data, because the client accounts, they can double based on all the data that we showed you. And of course, the AUM per, uh, the AUM per client will increase based on the number of corporations that uh, we'll add. And of course, in 2017, we live in a world that one tweet from a certain president can move the market and the markets can be very volatile. So let's say the stock market, it will be a downturn. This is where the algos come in, that they can do free, much more frequent rebalancing than the portfolio managers can do. We believe we can mitigate that by th that solution. And of course, a new tech disruption that will in the, uh, disrupt the industry Let's say if we, it's a small one, we can acquire that company or not, we can mitigate that by further, let's say, doing more algos that are more doable for our clients. In conclusion, we believe you have what it takes to grow and become market leaders again. So all you have to do is take the action. We are now ready for all of your questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, very well presented. Very neat handwriting. Um, so there was a there was a theme which I was interested in, which is obviously around attracting the wealthy traditional investors to our business, and um, you, 
you're attracting them through cost, pricing, and the human touch. Can you just tell me a little bit more about the human touch element, exactly what that's going to involve? Uh, maybe I missed that. Uh, the human touch element is to involve not uh, individuals who will be focusing on the algorithms themselves, but explaining the algorithms to our customers. So one aspect of that is the weekly blog we discussed, in which uh, there will be a weekly blog to summarize what's happening uh, in our current in your company, as well as in the industry, as well as the Q&A section, which will be able to allow customers to ask questions and have them answered on a whole, where any customer can then see those questions and answers. The other aspect is a few uh, sales representatives who can then explain the uh, market and the role that Wealthfront has to the customers who seek that service for anyone who has $100,000 and more. Did I answer all of your questions? Um, but um, just, again, talking through those wealthy traditional investors, the human touch is not the competitive advantage necessarily, it's matching what's out there, the pricing you've undercut. Is that what we're doing? We're bringing them over on cost. First of all, cost. Second of all is due to the, the human aspect was to gain trust because the case indicates that most investors don't like working with uh, robots due to the lack of a human aspect because they can't trust a robot, they can't have the robot explain to them what's happening. So. What we suggested is maintaining the transparency that the robot algorithm offers, but allowing a human interaction to maintain the trust while offering the competitive price that we suggested. So uh, you mentioned that a company, our company, is facing the challenge that the industry giants are getting into the fintech segment. So uh, they will even acquire our competitors to and give them the financial resources to expand the business. So uh, can you tell us more about how your organization can actually enable our company to fend off such a new competition from the industry giant? One way that we can fend off the industry giants is by offering competitiveness that the industry giants don't offer. So the industry giants are offering, for example, $50,000 minimum uh, investment. So we're catering to smaller customers who don't have that uh, free cash to offer as well as a lot of uh, people in the tech industry don't trust uh, the tech giant, uh, the big giants of the industry, which is why we've been, you've been so successful so far in targeting this industry, which is why part of our suggestion was to focus on this industry itself, where you're, you've shown your competitive advantage. Well, uh, but if we stay uh, on our own feet, and uh, our major competitors, such as a bad woman, that acquired by, say, HRBC, and uh, they have the resources to compete with us, and they can actually launch a price war in order to uh, get us uh, away from the market, then they capture all the more market share. So uh, how can we actually uh, face such uh, increasing challenges from, from such a scenario? Our data indicated that due to your unique position in the market as someone who the tech industry specifically favors, that's Based on that, we suggested focusing your penetration on that market initially. After you've achieved growth in that market, then you can divers diversify in into other markets where competitors like HSBC are dominant and it's harder to succeed in that market. So we believe that your position as a very transparent, user-friendly, and uh, cost-efficient person will be able to compete with HSBC even if they were to offer much lower costs. And but currently, you do offer the most competitive pricing and no other competitor has shown any indication of dropping their prices similarly. No other, so, but we've not been in, for example, the, the wealthy end, we've not been there before, which is where our competition is. So we've not seen the adjustment of price and competition price because we've not been there. What data do we have to... We, uh, my previous answer was targeting how we could resist HSBC or similar giants in the tech industry. For when we move into the pension industry and the that sector, we believe that most people who have pensions and retirement funds seek to maximize their growth. And since currently we are offering a segment up in which we have the most competitive prices and we aren't seeing any creeping of prices from our competitors, we believe that a similar strategy will take place in other industries where uh, 
giants such as HSBC and other companies will not try to lower their margin to acquire a few customers because their market segment is already much larger. So they won't try to impinge on us and, and lower their margin across their entire customer base. To add to what my colleague said is that based on what we saw since the financial crisis till now, Let's say hedge funds have underperformed, traditional asset managements have underperformed the market. And what we bring is the, let's we remove the, emo, what you bring is you remove the emotions because main, the main reason of the 2008 crisis was of course ego when let's say people didn't want to sell some assets, what happened with Lehman Brothers, etc. So to target the wealthy clients that are not necessarily pure value investors like Warren Buffett but somewhere between people who do pure algorithms and Warren Buffett, somewhere in the middle, but who have the tendency to adapt further to the new tech, to the new tech, let's say, to the new tech algorithms. So those are the wealthy clients that we targeted, hence the reason the new, our new cost structure that you, you can provide, which for, let's say, for clients who have 50 or 100 million dollars, that, that, let's say, 0.1% would make a huge difference to them because it's all about returns and even that small percentage can affect them. the additional PhDs make? Um, they bring more credibility. So after more, all... More means better. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So it's uh, after all, it is a financial institution and a financial institution needs to inspire a lot of trust by the public and the common language that everyone speaks across the world is education. So a PhD would make a huge difference and attract more people to our So uh, we are now facing a problem of high customer acquisition costs and you are recommending that we can take part in those uh, tech conferences to uh, increase our brand awareness. Um, apart from this, would there be any other measures where we can acquire, increase our penetration, acquire more customers at a lower cost manner? Some other measures that we can take would be having our sales representatives actively pursue the corporations that I discussed previously, such as Facebook and Twitter. And by pursuing these corporations, we would automatically ensure that all of their employees would have preference towards your company. But um, why do you expect those employers to <coughs> encourage their employees to take part in the program? Would there be any incentive for them to do so? because uh, previous corporations such as Facebook and Twitter have shown extreme success by partnering with us. And the tech community in Silicon Valley specifically is very small and tight-knit. So these individuals often network and in essence like to brag about how they found the lowest cost or the best uh, effect. And so by bragging, they are basically creating free marketing for you, in which case they will be encouraging other people to also use your company. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.